Yes, yes, everybody. Welcome back to YouTube. Welcome back to Threadman Chazza. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're having a, a good holiday season. If you're enjoying your holidays, I hope you're enjoying your summer. The weather's not too great in here in England at the moment, but I still hope you're managing to enjoy the summer if you're in England. If you're abroad, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're all well. Um, so, yeah, guys, we're back today with another video on Rasmus Hoyland. So apologies about the slight delay. I've just been very, very busy with work uh, recently, but we're going to go through the profile of Rasmus Hoyland. The topic of discussion today is going to be, is Rasmus Hoyland a £64 million bargain? So that is the question I'm going to put to you all. You can have a think about that. And we're going to try and dissect everything about Hoyland in this video. So please do leave a like if you enjoy. Please do subscribe if you're new as well. Um, I do lots of content on Twitter. I do written content. And then after I do a piece of written content, I come in here, come here on YouTube and I sort of explain my thoughts behind that written content, what I, why I said it, what, you know, what, what, it, what about this content is interesting. I hope some of it is. Um, and sort of, obviously I had extra points as well, right? Because you know that with written content, you've always got a sort of maximum word limit. Whereas when you're speaking, you can express your thoughts in more depth. So that's what we're going to do guys. So let's get into it. So um, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about strengths, weaknesses, what he had at Atalanta versus what he might have at Manchester United in terms of setup, tactical elements, and also his current ability now versus what he could be in the future. All right, so that's what we're going to discuss in this video. So let's start with the movement in the boxing. So I don't really want to uh, play this video um, because of copyright and stuff like that. But one of Rasmus Hoyland's biggest strengths is his movement in the box. And in particular, you get some strikers who are very good at moving to the near post, to the far post. Hoyland has a little bit of both. And what he does really, really well, Hoyland, is he can use his very, very quick darting movement to distract or sort of make a sort of a decoy run and then trick the defender and then move the other way. So you'll see here he's sort of in the centre of the picture with the opposition player. And you see here on this one, you can see there he's starting to move um, towards the, the near post, right? So if we say the ball is on our left-hand side as we're looking at it, okay? So the ball is on our left-hand side. And so you see the goalkeeper is looking towards uh, the left-hand side there. And the ball is about to come in. The ball's in, out wide in a certain position. We can't quite see where the ball is right now. But you'll see Hoyland is making a run. You can see the way his feet are moving. He's making a run towards the near post. And then you see he just checks his run towards the back post. You'll see there. And then you see there his movement again towards the near post. You'll see the defender's body positioning there in the blue. So Hoyland is in the red and the defender's in the blue. You'll see, you can see by the, the defenders, the way that they're standing, the way that they're moving. That defender is just getting a little bit sort of moving towards Hoyland's movement towards the back post. And then Hoyland drags back towards the near post. And you see the defender's sort of wrong-footed, and he ends up on the wrong side of Hoyland, and Hoyland taps the ball into the goal, and he scores. So this is a really nice aspect of Hoyland's game, and there's other examples of this movement as well. Particularly important for Manchester United, we know we need a striker, we know we've now got Hoyland in, um, and we know that last season we underperformed on our expected goals. So that was an area of concern in terms of finishing our chances off. So um, if we can have a striker who can make maybe what isn't a great cross into a great cross by getting on the end of it, by distracting defenders, by making decoy runs and then choosing near or far post again, sort of tricking defenders with his movement, we can obviously create chances. OK, um, here's another example here. Um, this is a gift, so we're okay to uh, to play this one. Um, so you'll see here Hoyland sort of in the centre of the box, and then he sort of pulls off towards the near post. It's quite a simple movement. This one, it's not as not as complicated, but you can see by the speed at which he's moving, he can really get in front of defenders really, really well. You know, there's some strikers who are a little bit more static um, when they are when you're in the box and you're surrounded by defenders. Your movement has got to be, firstly, your, your decision-making has got to be good, that split-second decision-making, but also the way in which you execute that movement has got to be quick. And obviously, um, Erling Haaland, and I'm not going to be comparing Hoyland and Haaland, but I'm just talking about 
an area of Haaland's game that I admire a lot is the way that Haaland, not just his movement in terms of how he sort of where he moves, but it's how he moves. It's how quickly he does it, how quickly he gets in front of that defender to get to the ball. And Hoyland's movement is also very, very good in that aspect. Um, I've also mentioned on this point here, if Hoyland, if defenders know, OK, I need to be careful of Hoyland's run. Well, obviously, those defenders are going to be attracted more towards Hoyland. What could that do? That could obviously leave space for other players. You'll see here the player for Atalanta that's coming in towards the back post. If the ball does come to this player at the back post, number 77, I think it might be Zappa Costa. Uh, that's my guess, the Atalanta right wing back. Because defenders are attracted towards that run, obviously that does leave space for late runners. So if we can make the most of Hoyland's movement directly, fantastic, but also indirect impacts could be defenders could get attracted towards Hoyland and that obviously could leave more space for late arrivers in the box. Um, sort, of, sort of what Ilkay Gundogan is fantastic at doing. And obviously, he's at Barcelona now, but Donny van der Beek is obviously probably going to leave, but that's an aspect of his game that's really, really good. Hopefully, we can make the most of that with our other players as well. Um, so ball striking, sort of shooting. So this is a, a shot map from my good friend Anurag. So make sure you follow him twi on Twitter. His uh, Twitter username is at the bottom left there. Uh, we worked we worked together for this project. So he pr he produced the data visualizations, and I um, I did a lot of research. Um, he did a lot of research as well, and then we sort of came together um, with some gifs and some visualizations and. Uh, I did quite a lot of the text. He also added some text in as well. Um, so we all gathered, we both gathered our thoughts. So it was a really, really good piece. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did read it, if you want to have a read, certainly go and have a read. Um, but this is a visualization he sort of produced. So you'll see a lot of Hoyland shots, obviously coming from the center of the box, but also there's, there's more from the left-hand side as well. Um, so um, you'll see here, yeah, he tends to shoot across goal from the left-hand side. So this is this is an interesting point because a lot of attacking players with, that are left-footed nowadays, they like to peel off to the right-hand side and they like to curl shots towards the far post, right? Whether it be a winger, a forward, a wide forward, an inside forward or, or a striker, we see a lot of left-footers who they quite like shooting from the right-hand side across to the far post. And Hoyland actually prefers shooting from that left sort of half space area towards the far post. Now, where could he sort of, um, where could he improve in, in terms of his finishing when he is here on goal? Well, a bit more composure, a bit more composure. So he overperformed his XG last season by about one, which is good. Um, you know, the best strikers in the world overperformed by obviously a few points, but we underperformed overall as a team last season. So that means that we created, we were expected to score so many goals. I think we underperformed by about eight goals as a team last season. So obviously, if we do, we know we need a striker. If we do bring a striker in who can help us be a bit more efficient, even a little bit more efficient by a goal or two, that could make a big difference across the season. You never quite know. You know, there were some big chances we had in big games last season that we didn't take um, that obviously could have made a big, big difference to our season. Yeah, so makes a big, big difference. Where could he improve, though, Hoyland? He is not an absolutely clinical finisher. So, for example, here, you'll see in this video, just about to start here. So this is another part of his game that we're, we're going to highlight in a minute, but you'll see how fast he is. The acceleration is crazy. And just here, when you just need a little bit of composure, the goalkeeper's rushing out. He opts for more power, um, and the goalkeeper leaves a leg in. He saves with his legs, obviously, there with his feet. But... That is an area of Hoyland's game he can improve. He's still only 20, so we expect that to improve, of course. Um, so, yeah, he's not he's not incredibly clinical. He does he can maybe improve his decision-making on the types of shots he makes. For instance, let's say in this, in this example, right, it's very, very difficult. I, I mean, any of us that have played football at a basic level, you know when you're running at speed, to try and control your finish, it's really, really hard. But that's an area of Hoyland's game he can improve. Can he lob the keeper? Can he place the ball? Can he, you know, can he chip the keeper slightly? Um, can he just raise the ball? He doesn't even need to lob him fully. Just raise it over his 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 leg, the, the feet that he's got remained on that side to try and save it. Obviously, he's left his, his legs in there to try and save it. But just a little bit more composure. So this obviously shows his threat in transition. So Eric Ten Hag obviously mentioned Manchester United. We want to be the best transition team in the world. Um, Hoyland can actually generate his own transition opportunities. So you, yes, you can 
sort of send balls in behind to him. We've got like Bruno who can, Luke Shaw as well, who can provide really, really good balls in behind. Uh, Mount to an extent at times as well. Um, really good passes in behind defences. But also Hoyland can generate these opportunities, opportunities on his own because he's extremely, he's actually extremely technical um, for such a young player. And for a striker, he offers, he can create chances on his own by his movement, but also his ball carrying. So we'll see this in a minute. He's a quite, he's a decent dribbler for a striker. He's actually an okay dribbler um, and he can carry the ball quite well. So he can carry the ball past players. So we are going to cover that in a moment, but obviously that can increase United's threat in transition. So this is something that United will obviously um, want from Hoyland. Um, what about off the ball then? So this is a statistic you guys have probably seen it a few times now. I've used it a few times already. Um, this statistic um, comes from The Athletic um, and it looks at the number of high regains in the um, in the attacking third um, for the last few years. So you'll see the number um, under Mourinho was quite low. Um, it sort of rises to maybe a peak of just over sort of just over three high regains per game and then under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, the peak got to about, what's that, about five and a half, five and a half per game. And then under Ralph Ranić, we sort of, at one stage, we were on that sort of five and a half level. If you look along the graph, um, if you look towards sort of the y-axis, we were sort of five and a half. And then obviously it dropped under Ranić when we were really underperforming. And then you'll see in, under Eric Ten Hag, um, at the start of the season, you'll see that little dip when we were a bit more conservative away at Southampton, home to Arsenal, um, away at Leicester. We we obviously sacrificed a bit more possession and we were a bit more conservative. We played sort of a mid-block. We didn't really press high in those games. But you'll see under Ten Hag, we actually got, what's that? We actually got up towards the seven, sort of 6.7, 6.8 per game, probably that is, at the peak. So you'll see there, under Eric Ten Hag, we improved the volume of high regains. What does that mean? It just simply means Manchester United are pressing more effectively in the opposition's defensive third. How could Hoyland improve that? Well, Rasmus Hoyland is a decent presser. So we had that debate last season about Ronaldo and then Veghorst came in. Um, and I think Val Veghorst, for me, he actually, he pressed back better than he pressed forwards. And I'm going to explain what that means. That means like if the ball had gone past him and the ball was behind him, he pressed back really, really well. But when he was pressing forward, he was sort of, at times he wasn't pressing effectively. It was just sort of running around a bit. And I don't think that's really what we want. We want more effective pressing. So um, this is what Hoyland can do. Um, I tried to find, I've, I've looked through a lot of games from Hoyland. I've watched about um, 15 full 90s. Well, the equivalent of 15 full 90s, because he didn't, as I said, he played um, 20 full, the equivalent of 20 full 90s last season. So I did manage to watch a lot of his minutes from last season. And what I found from Hoyland is that he was quite good at reading pressing triggers. So a pressing trigger is, you know, when you are looking at an opposition and their weakness, when the ball goes to a fullback, when the ball goes to their centre back, when the ball goes to their midfield player, that's when we start to press, right? That's what a pressing trigger is. So I found that Hoyland was quite good at reading those pressing triggers. And Anu Rag, the person I work with in this project, also found the same. Um, and he's an intense presser. So you'll see here the pressure he's putting on the goalkeeper. Um, he's noticed um, that's, that, you know, we, we're going to we're gonna really press high here. His teammates could probably be slightly higher at the pitch. Um, but he reads the opportunity to go and press. One area where he can improve is curving his runs, right? That's an area he can improve. If you curve your run when you press, you block off a passing lane. So that's an area he can improve. But I think compared to when Ronaldo was here, and also I think eventually compared to where Veghorst was here, I think Rasmus Hoyland will also enable us to improve our pressing, the execution of our pressing. And I think Mason Mount will also help that as well. So that's another big, big positive of his game. It's not He's not elite at it. He's not even extremely good at it yet. He's just a decent to good presser right now. And I think that will help us. And I think he will only improve. So what about, we've talked about his, his sort of shooting ability. Um, we've talked about um, sort of where he takes his shots. We've talked about pressing. So what about, can he create any chances, Hoyland? Is he just a typical out and out goal scorer or can he also create chances? Well, the answer is he can create chances. So he likes to go into the half spaces. 
at times and into the channels. So he doesn't just stay in the width of the sort of the 18 yard box. And that's quite interesting because we've seen a sort of transition among strikers, I think, down the years where typically sort of 20, 30, 40 years ago, we had that sort of traditional number nine. And that traditional number nine traditionally would stay in a certain zone. The ball would be obviously kicked up long. We'd look for flick-ons. We'd try and win a free kick, get the team up the pitch. They're kind of the basics of football. And your striker would be expected most of the time to, to stay in, in, in the width of the 18-yard box and try and feed off any chances. Quite rarely you might have found one or two strikers who like to venture out and be a bit more creative as well as the goal scorer. But that's what we talk about when we talk about the traditional number nine. They're, they're remaining in the width of the 18-yard box. So Rasmus Hoyland isn't like that. So last season, he ranked in the, the sort of top quarter, between the top quarter and the top third of all strikers in the in the top leagues for shot-creating action. So that means he is making, he is producing actions that are leading to shots. Okay. So how does he create these these shots for other players? Well, this is another great um, visualization from Anurag, and this suggests that he likes to carry the ball, and he also likes to receive the ball in certain zones. So he he has more progressive carries in that sort of left channel, left half space. That means that he ventures out to that channel more, and he uses that channel more to carry the ball. So he likes that left channel and that left half space. He likes to venture out there and he doesn't mind taking a, one or two players on. Okay. So that's an interesting thing because we know Marcus Rashford likes to come inside that run in between uh, fullback and centre back, the opposition's right back and the right centre back. That's a run that Marcus Rashford likes to make. So it's an interesting dynamic we're getting here already. We could see a lot of, we know under Ten Hag, he uses um, sort of positional play um, principles. And we could see a lot of, um, we, we've already seen a lot of those principles being introduced, but we have also seen a lot of fluidity and a lot of rotations between players. Eric Ten Hag does not say, my striker must stay in this zone, my winger must stay in that zone, my fullback must stay in that zone. He just says, there must be a player occupying one of these zones at any time, as long as there is someone there. And that's an interesting point, I think, when we're talking about Hoyland and Rashford. Because I think these two players could interchange quite a lot between that left-hand side and the, the the striker position. So don't be surprised when you see Hoyland. And I know he's got a slight injury. And we'll see what happens with that. When he does start playing and he gets up to speed. So let's give him a bit of time to get fully up to speed. Don't be surprised if you do see him sort of trying to take players on in that left channel and Rashford going more centrally. That could be something to look out for. He also likes to receive... He also likes to receive the ball more in that right channel when he is um, looking to get on the ball. Okay, so obviously there's also a lot in that in that left half space as well, but there's a lot of reception in that right channel. So he likes to get on the ball. He's not just going to stay in the box and wait for crosses to come in. He likes to drop a bit deeper and he likes to get on the ball. Um, yeah, and he, he ranks in the top seven of strikers who carries into the box and he attempts a high amount of take-ons about just over a third are successful. So he could still improve um, when he takes on players, he can improve his sort of retention and his accuracy his his execution of getting past the defenders. But there's certainly promise there that he can be creative as well as a goal scorer. This is an example of what Hoyland can do in wide areas. So you'll see him in the striker position there originally um just to the right of the pink referee and you see he makes that run into that left channel and then look at the way he uses his strength power pace to get past the defender and it obviously it generates a good chance you know there could have been somebody running on the end of that but you'll see here look at the way he uses his body that quick turn around the corner um, and he obviously gets across it now there's also a lot of examples i could have given you that he doesn't do that successfully there's a lot of examples where he goes out and he loses the ball. And obviously you say, oh, why did you include the one that's successful? I am aware I'm, when I do my threads and the guys who follow me will know, um, people who follow me will know that I, I don't just, you know, find the odd clip here and there. I do have a, I try and have the best study, the best. I spend hours and hours finding the, the most suitable clips. And I also found a lot of clips where he did lose the ball. And that's why I said in the last tweet, a lot of, a lot of the take-ons he does. So, 
more or less two out of three are unsuccessful. So this is certainly an area of his game he can improve, but there's certainly some promise there. And I also mentioned here about Sancho in the false nine. If we do see Sancho in the false nine in certain games as well, um, I think it's going to be really, really interesting um, to see what happens when Hoyland vacates that central area. Because... I think Jaden Sancho is best in central zones. So even if Sancho lines up on the left or the right and Rashford as well with Hoyland, those players are going to be so interchangeable and it gives Eric Ten Hag a lot more fluidity. If you've got a striker who's only comfortable in central areas and in the width of the 18-yard box, what happens if you can't get the ball to that striker continuously? How are you going to create chances? Well, if we have a striker that's like Rasmus Hoyland, we can actually rotate players in game what does that do well that actually makes it harder for the opposition to mark right let's say um you know i'm speaking to one of one of the viewers right now let's say you're my center back partner right and we're looking at the game we know we've got hoyland as the striker one of you guys is the right back and one of you guys is the left back right so we're a back four and let's say after 30 minutes eric ten Hag, we're drawing nil nil and eric ten Hag thinks oh, we're not getting any type of service we can't hold the ball up we're not threatening in behind we're losing our individual battles what can we do okay eric ten Hag shouts up rasmus marcus Jaden, anthony whoever it might be what we're going to do we're going to rotate for 15 minutes rasmus hoyland goes out to the left rashford plays up front sancho um goes to the right yeah or we could have sancho goes in the middle rashford goes to the right hoyland goes left or rashford stays on the left Hoyland goes to the right and Sancho comes into the middle. And there's so many different variations you can you can do on this. And Hoyland is comfortable in slightly wider areas. So don't be surprised if that happens. So if you're a young player and you have a lot of physical contact, you know, you're playing up against big centre halves who can probably think, oh, I can bully this striker, but he's only a young lad. How do you react to that? Well, well, Rasmus Hoyland reacts very, very well. You see here, the ball's played up to him. He's getting pushed, shoved, all sorts, but he's just carrying on. He's continuing. He's trying to still get to the ball, and that's it's actually effective in the end, Atalanta to keep the ball. And this is something I've noticed with Hoyland a lot, and this is a point that Anurag um, came up with. So big credit to Anurag for this, about the way that he reacts to this physical contact. He doesn't just moan. He doesn't just go down and try and get a free kick and like shout and scream on the floor like a lot of footballers does. He gets back up and he tries to regain the ball. He tries to make something of it. So that's really, really, it's a really, really good sign. Dispossession. So what about, um, oh, very interesting. We've just got a David Ornstein bomber. <laughs> it's just come through on my phone. Southampton have received an offer for Romeo Lavia. Oh, dear. Uh, from Chelsea, unfortunately. Um, I wish it said Manchester United. Like my heart stopped for a minute there. <laughs> but back to Rasmus Hoyland. Um, David Onstein always drops a bomber when you're on YouTube every time. Um, back to Rasmus Hoyland. He ranks quite high in dispossessions per 90. What does that mean? Well, the ball gets taken off him. As simple as that. When does this happen? Well, when he's got a physical defender behind him. Example here. He can struggle to take the ball in into his feet and hold off the defender and turn. That is an area of his game he can improve. Right, That is an area of his game he can improve. So how can he improve this? Well, I think it's just maintaining the same attitude that we talked about in the last tweet, right? Just maintaining that, that attitude to, to keep going and also to try to get more experience of these battles. And I think he will get this in the Premier League. I think he will experience more of these types of battles against very, very physically imposing defenders. So let's have a look at what he said. He actually said, um, Chris Smalling from Roma gave me the biggest problems. He's an intelligent, agile, fast, physically strong defender. I tried to win duels with him by using my physical strength, but it wasn't the winning move. I still have to find the right key to overcome it. So this is an example from the game that I picked out. Um, probably best to, to keep it on the big screen. So the ball goes up to Hoyland here. You'll see it's about to go into Hoyland, you'll see Smalling, the way that Smalling's body is shaped, you know that Smalling's about to close in on Hoyland. He gives him a slight nudge 
and Hoyland actually loses his balance. You can see there how off balance he is, and Roma regain possession. And that's just one example. Um, what does that mean for the wider part of his game? Well, he's just said here, I tried to use my physical strength, but it wasn't the winning move. So Rasmus Hoyland, as we mentioned, he is a strong player, but sometimes you, you, you're just not strong enough against these top defenders. So how can he overcome it? Well, he's going to have to find out how to overcome it. Can he, can he perhaps improve his first touch? Can he improve his first touch? Can he, instead of um, sort of not choosing, but instead of finding himself up against a really, really strong centre-back, can he maybe find the weaker of the defenders to try and receive the ball to? So we saw before he receives the ball a lot in this right-hand zone. And that's actually where he sort of is receiving the ball on this occasion, if you think about it, in that sort of right half space area. So that's where he's receiving receiving the ball. Can he vary it more often and try and find the weaker of the defenders to try and get on the ball and give himself a bit of a confidence in game? Because you guys know, if you've played football, even at a basic level, if you if your first action or two actions in a game of football are positive, it gives you a lot of confidence for the rest of the game. So if Rasmus Hoyland is going up against Chris Smalling and he's losing the first few battles in the first five minutes, that's obviously going to really kill his confidence for the rest of the game. Can he find a way to sort of pin himself up against defenders who are maybe the weaker defenders? So that's maybe a, an area of his game. Obviously, if you're playing against, you know, a, a top team with all physical players, it's difficult, but he, there's always a weak link and you're only as strong as your weakest link. So Hoyland could find um, a way of trying to deal with these battles. Aerial ability. Um, he's not the best aerially, although he is six foot three. Um Anurag produced a great, great thread on this. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Um, he is not he is not the best um, when the ball is coming from a goal kick and trying to head it on. That's not where he is best. I think he receives best to his feet, although that could improve as well. Um, but his aerial ability isn't the best. Um, so, so, yeah, that's an area of his game he can improve. And I'm sure Benny McCarthy might be able to help with that. Um, like Rashford has already scored. I think he scored four or five headers last season, if my memory... I'm not sure exactly on the number, but Rashford scored a few headers last season. I think he scored as many last season as he might have done combined before in his United career or something like that. So Rashford has improved in the air. I hope Rasmus Hoyland can also improve. It's not through a lack of height or strength. It's just about timing, timing of your jump, the um, decision-making when to obviously make that move towards the front or near post and when to jump. Hoyland can improve on the aerial aspect. This goes back to the earlier point. Shot technique could improve. Um, and also, this is a great point that Anurag suggested. As I said before, he likes that shot from the left half space to the far post. Maybe can he add a near post finish? A lot of his goals are from the left-hand side to the far post. Can he maybe add a near post finish? You know, can he try and catch more goalkeepers out? Because if goalkeepers know that the ball, it's like when Anthony tries those curlers into the top corner from the right-hand side for, into the far corner, goalkeepers obviously know what's coming. So can you add more unpredictability to your game? That would obviously improve um, Rasper Soylent's game. Um, transition we talked about before. He had scope, Rasmus Hoyland. He had scope to use his transitional strengths at Atalanta. You can see here there's a big, big difference um, sort of between the number of direct attacks in both bo in both leagues, right? There's a huge jump um, sort of in the Premier League compared to the Serie A, um, for the, especially for the f sort of top three um, teams in each division, which sort of, that sort of highlights the speed at which each division is played at and the sort of stylistic differences between the Serie A and the Premier League. Um, but you'll see here, Atalanta had the fourth most direct attacks in the Serie A last season. Manchester United had the most. So did Atalanta use Rasmus Hoyland's transitional strength to full effect? Not yet. So this is an interesting thing that I noticed that I think uh, Manchester United can make more of is Hoyland's um, sort of his strengths in transition, the way, as I said before, the pace, the sheer acceleration, um, the ball carrying, also the link-up play isn't bad at all. So I think we could use these to greater effect next season. So that's scope for Ho Hoyland's transitional strengths to improve even further and the volume 
um, to improve further, of course. Um, what, what else at Atalanta? A few things I noticed, as, as always, I like to do these, um, these int- find these interesting little stats. So for Atalanta and Sturm Graz, I'm sorry about the pronunciation, a team in Austria, I believe, um, where Hoyland played before, he's very often played in a two-man partnership. So for Atalanta, they play a 3-4-1-2 or 3-4-2-1 or variations of a 3-5-2, basically. So they have two front men, um, Zapata, Luckman, Muriel and Hoyland were the four main ones um, from last season. Um and then at Sturm Grass, he was also used in a in in a four four two diamond as a, as one of the two strikers. So he has been part of a front two, a striker partnership basically for a lot of his career. So I noticed that, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting point to include because obviously under Eric Ten Hag, we're we're going to use a one man striker partnership, a, a one man striker. Sorry, we're going to use a lone striker. Yeah, a one man striker partnership. What am I on about? I'm still a bit triggered about that uh, Lavia and Chelsea news. I hope Man United hijack it. <laughs> um, I think he'd be okay. I think he would. The, the 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 issue and the worry I had here was, would Rasmus Hoyland be able to, as I mentioned before, he doesn't like to stay in the width of the 18-yard box. So would he have the freedom to move into the channels, into the half spaces more often? Because he's the lone striker, because obviously, theoretically, you could say, well, no, because if he's your only striker, you want to keep at least one player in that zone. But I think because of the way Ten Hag plays, because of the positional play principles, he he likes to use the rotations. There's always got to be one player in that sort of central zone. But I think the amount of rotations we use um, and the fact that Rashford, Bruno and um, Mount are sort of very often make runs in behind in those half spaces, I think we'd be absolutely fine. So if Hoyland did come out and pull out to the wide area, I think in that six yard area, we'd have um, sort of one of those other players making a movement sort of centrally. Um, So I don't think we'd have an issue there. Just an interesting point I I, I sort of noticed. This is an interesting one. Uh, There's been a lot of talk in the media about the fee, as you'll see at the title of the video, a 64 million pounds up front. I think there's 8 million pound in add-ons. So 72 million pound is the, biggest we can we, we we're gonna be we're gonna be paying to Atalanta. Is this worth it? Well I actually dig deeper into the stat. He played 32 league games, but only the equivalent of 20 full 90 minutes. And the fact that he got nine goals and two assists means more or less he's scoring or assisting every other game. And for a 20 year old, that's pretty impressive. Okay. Pretty impressive. So are Manchester United paying for what he is now or what he is in the future? It's a bit of both. Um, There's still inconsistencies and weaknesses in his game, as I've talked about on the stream. Um, But I'm confident in Eric Ten Hag, um, for him to manage his game well, uh, manage his game time well, manage when to introduce him well. And I think we've um, we've got some options to rotate him with. I still think we need another striker. Um, I don't think it's all that likely at the moment. I think Harry Kane would have obviously been the dream with Hoyland. That would have been incredible um, depth. Um, and I don't think we need. I don't think we should be relying too much on Hoyland this season. I'm expecting him to score about 12 to 15 goals in all competitions. So we'll see whether I'm right on that. Um, I'll probably be way out. Um, but I'm expecting him to score about 12, 12 goals in all competitions. I'm not expecting 20 plus in all comps. Um, so I think he will have bad games. I think he'll show real promise in some games. Um, so I think Manchester United are probably paying like. 30 million pounds for what he is now and then we might be paying an extra th- well we are going to pay it obviously but i'm speaking hypothetically that extra 34 million pound is sort of like what he could become or and the extra 18 add-ons possibly so for me it could end up being a very very shrewd piece of business i think it's still a very very big fee for a player that has not had loads of great seasons but i can see a lot of promise there so yeah thanks a lot for for reading, etc. So that's what I said there. But yes, guys, so that is it on Rasmus Hoyland. Um, I think it's really, really interesting to see um, how this deal has developed, how quickly it got done. Um, I think we did a pretty good job um, getting him in reasonably quickly. Obviously, it's a bit of a setback about his injury, but I'm not too concerned about that. I think that will all get sorted out quite quickly. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, We're going to have another video coming in the next few weeks 
on um, possibly Jean-Claire Todibo um, if we sign him from Nice and also Sofian Amrabat if we sign him from Fiorentina. So um, I'm going to try and make sure every piece of work I do on Twitter also comes here on YouTube. I would love to be able to do a proper like five or 10 minute video breakdown without my face in the way and actually doing like ed an edited video on Hoyland. But I just obviously I don't have the time, guys. Like I can't do all the Twitter stuff and all the YouTube stuff all on my own. So I am a one man team. Um, so we're going to continue doing it this way for now. I'm also hoping to do some live streams throughout the season, match reviews. I'm going to try and bring a panel of guests on as well um, now and again. So please do subscribe for the new content. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Please do follow me on Threadman Chazza for more threads like this. Um, you can check the thread out on Threadman Chazza. It's my pinned tweet. And yes, guys, I really appreciate all the support. Please do leave a like, share if you enjoyed, uh, subscribe if you're new, and we'll be back again soon with another video. Cheers, guys.